I was really excited to find some a, a lecture that I did in class that had some really good audio. So you can get some of the questions that the students had and uh, probably hear a few of my divergent thoughts about all sorts of things, especially, you know, the mitochondrion. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to bring you into, the, in, into my classroom itself. And uh, I really want to make sure you understand that finally you're getting to the part that you thought you were going to be at at the beginning of the semester when you took biology because we're going to start talking about all the parts of the cell. Um, I'm going to give you some brief background information about it. You don't need to write most of this down uh, because I, I, it's history. And I'm not going to really um, quiz you on the history aspect as much as I want you to see the bigger pictures. So I'll tell you when it's really important to start writing things down again. So here's the deal. 1665, a new tool of science was created called the microscope. We've heard of these things, right? We have a whole bunch of them back there. Um, it was created by a gentleman named Robert Hooke. And like any good scientist, so do you guys know how to mic uh, a light microscope works, basically? You've got one lens stacked on top of another lens. You look down through one, and it magnifies through the other as well. Have you ever looked through somebody else's glasses before? It's kind of weird. Thank you. It's kind of weird. You um, start to see like things that are, are far away, and they look close up, and they look all distorted. Um, people have had this magnification technology for a long time. I mean, the Chinese were using it for thou probably about 2,000 years. You know what a spy glass is? Yeah. If not, think of what pirates use when they're like, looking at other ships like that. It was one of those. Uh, so you're looking through the uh, spyglass. One end has a curved lens. The other end has a curved lens. And it magnifies both. So you see things up really close. So what he was using was sort of piggybacking on that technology. Because have you guys ever played with a spyglass before? If you do it, you do two things. One, you see things that are really far away. And then immediately you like look down. You're like, what does it look like up close? It's pretty much what Hook did. He's like, all right, I got these two lenses, and now I'm looking down. And what did he have nearby? A cork off a wine bottle. Now, I'm not going to make any um, disparaging remarks about Hook, but, you know, having that wine bottle sitting in his lab is kind of cool. <laughs> it's like, looking around with this, looking at this. Oh, yeah, look at that. And what he noticed in the cork were these, um, what looked like chambers. They looked like squares. And he said... Those look like, as you would at the time, the cells of a monastery. And thus he called them cells. It's where monks would live. All right, about 100 years later, we had this microscope now. It didn't have much of a purpose. I mean, really, you couldn't do much because the glass in it was so poor. If you've ever looked through the bottom of a bottle, any kind of bottle, I'm not, again, college students, I understand, but if you're looking through the bottom of a bottle trying to find that last drop of whatever, um, <laughs> you'll notice it's very distorted. You can't really see other people. They're kind of all blurred and weird. Well, optical glass wasn't until like the 1800s. Yeah, 1775, actually. Almost, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly when. Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, so what, he, what they ended up doing about 100 years later was coming up with a new glass-making technology where they're coming up with this optical lenses that can do more. A gentleman by the name of Anton von Leeuwenhoek um, <laughs> There are several weird, um, uh, several weird uh, punctuation things that go in that name that I just didn't have the right characters on the computer to put in. So there is definitely a hawking in the back of the throat. Uh, sounds that don't exist in English. Sounds that don't exist in English language. Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Um, he refined the techniques to make that glass. And he wanted to sell this new glassware. So what he did was to sell it, because business, right? You give people what they want. He said, check this out. I took two lenses. I put them on top of each other. This is what's living in the water that you're drinking. And he would show people these microorganisms. It was a selling point. Scientists turned around and said, that's really cool. There's stuff living on me. You have this thing called a microbiome, in case you didn't know. The microbiome is really freaky. And if you ever get around to looking at it, you will, you'll be amazed at how dirty people are. Not how dirty, but... Yeah, why, why you know, people are putting on the, um, the, the ethanol. Um, things like, uh, how many of you guys are in a relationship right now? Wow. 
Oh, wait, wait, wait. How many of you guys are in the It's Complicated? <laughs> okay, that's there you go. Um, the single, single's not going to cut it for you. Not, no, not for this particular discussion. Have you been in a relationship before? Yeah. All right. When you're looking deeply into somebody's eyes, you know, that whole first, second, third date, and then it's over thing. Um, <laughs> as you stare deeply into their eyes, you might glance at their uh, eyelashes. Now, don't let them know, but there could be things crawling all over them. Oh, I know. Yeah, that, well, this is, there's, there's stuff literally cleaning all of your hair follicles. There's stuff crawling all over you. Now, usually, we don't... Uh, she's going to go check. It's like, is it me? Is it me? Um, no, it's cool. <laughs> she didn't. Um, there's stuff crawling all over you. And now that we have this technology, we can look at it. You guys, a lot of you, uh, most of you have uh, phones. Uh, obviously, right? Um, you can zoom in really tight with the phone. And with the resolution they have now, if you were to hold that over even a single 10 times magnification and then zoom in even closer, you will be able to see the organisms crawling on you. Can you do that right? I don't have, a, I don't have an extra lens. I, I do. I just looked at the phone. Oh. Next time. Yeah, no, sorry. Don't, look, I will bring you an extra lens so you can do that. It's really interesting. In fact, when we um, next week, we're going to do the microscopy lab. Please feel free. I, these don't have recorders on them, but if you want to take your phone and hold it up to the lens, you'll be able to take pictures of the individual cells we're looking at. I call them selfies. Um, <laughs> right. Um, but you'll be able to take pictures, see it, show your friends. Science is cool. So, <laughs> so We've got the light microscope since about 1800. We were figuring out how the world was working and what all these little things crawling around in it were. 40 years after that, a guy named Matthias Schleiden, Schleiden's another German gentleman, um, he was a plant physiologist. So he's looking at plants using Leeuwenhoek's, <coughs> sorry, I need more spit, Leeuwenhoek's <laughs> technology. <laughs> Schleiden noticed that all plants everywhere, all of them had this dark spot in them. And he's like, huh. I would do it in German, but I can't. Huh. <laughs> I, sorry. I, 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 I've seen this dark spot in all of these plants. This is very interesting. He told his good friend, Theodor Schwann. Now, Schwann, Schwann, um, Schwann proposed uh, this idea. He was an animal physiologist. He's like, I too have seen these dark spots in, um, in cells. Maybe this is a thing all cells have. And they're like, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. They probably have them like bratwurst or something they're talking. Beer and bratwurst, right? Um, they proposed, uh, Schwann said, I'm going to publish a paper on this. And Schleiden said, no, 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 I came up with it. I'm going to publish a paper on it. And then they, they stopped being friends. Yeah. They raced. Schleiden uh, got his published first. Schwann followed immediately afterwards. Um, and between the two of them, they got this out into the public. There are these dark spots. 20 years after that, a Russian by the name of Rudolf Virchow was studying cancer cells. Cancer was bad even then. Cancer's been killing us for hundreds of years. It just seems like it's a lot worse now, and it might be. But it's probably because um, people are living to a much, much older age. And we're much more aware. We're able to spread the ideas. And it's not just... Like people, don't people don't die of natural causes anymore. Natural causes doesn't count. There's no such thing. Now it's just people die of if something particular, usually cancer. <laughs> so what um, Virkow noted was that normal cells make more normal cells. And cancer cells make more cancer cells. I know, go figure, but this is big news. Between the three of them, Schleiden, Schwann, and Virchow, need more time. Everybody okay? I like that you put all of the uh, PowerPoint stuff. Oh, yeah. Good. Now, the light microscope was super cool for its time, for 200 years. And in fact, it's still pretty cool, we still use it. Except there's a big sign on this that says, do not touch them, which is kind of weird for a biology class. We're going to touch them a lot. To hell with the sign. 
Um, there are some other microscopes that have come into play recently, the electron microscopes. And you have two kinds, the scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope. The scanning electron microscope works almost like a, you know those lasers at, uh, at, at a grocery store as you scan a barcode? They're coming out, and you'll notice that laser sort of follows along the contours of whatever you're scanning over it. That's what this scanning electron scope does. It scans over the contour of the cells, and it gives you a perfect three-dimensional image of those cells. The problem is you can only see the outside of the cell. A transmission electron microscope, on the other hand, fires electrons through a very, very thin section of cell. You have to, it takes a long time to make these slides because you may, take an organism and you slice it. Oh, they don't survive the process. Um, you sl uh, surround it in paraffin or in a wax, and then you slice it with what's called a microtome, which slices things to about one one thousandth the width of a hair. And then you would just put that on top of a slide in absolute vacuum in a purely clean room. How do you do that? Yeah. It's, it's really, it's, it's you, like, you'd you, you think that, but what ends up happening is it's all computer regulated. Oh, so you're not actually slicing and then, you know, it's, reach hand in there. no, you don't. It's, you do it all with these little robotic hands. It's kind of cool. Um, fires electrons through, and then you're able to see exactly what's happening. So what you're looking at here, these little individual sticking out pieces, these little hairs are actually individual proteins, individual molecules. You can look at, like, you don't, that doesn't have the resolution to hit just one atom, but we're really close. In fact, actually, I think they do have it where you can um, arrange individual atoms now. I think they have to view them with, like, charges, though. It's really hard to yeah, it's, it's tricky. So the thing is, for most of your lives, unless you are going into advanced biology or chemistry, you're never going to use those. Um, I don't even know where the closest, uh, probably actually VCU has one of these. I, I imagine they do. They are, and the, sometimes they take up one story, sometimes they're two stories high. Uh, they have to have specialized rooms for them, specialized power sources. They're really tricky. I've used uh, a scanning electron microscope exactly one time in my career, and it took me six months of training and three weeks to prepare the slide. And I got one picture. <laughs> that's no, that's not the picture I took. Uh, I was taking pictures of the proteins on the outside of a fly's egg. Yay! All right, so now we can see stuff, primarily with these uh, scanning li these light microscopes. Now we're going to talk about the types of cells that we see, and there are two broad categories: prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells have no compartmentalization. Eukaryotic cells have lots of compartments, lots of spaces where things happen. Prokaryotic cells are relatively simple. Things are just scattered all over the place, whereas eukaryotes have very, very complex structures. Um, do you guys know what I mean by compartmentalized? Have you heard that term before? Yeah, yeah everything has its proper place. Um, I would describe it as, so com as you're compartmentalized. Everything has its proper place. How many of you guys, you guys have a set of drawers? Yeah, okay, you've got a set of drawers. Do you have a sock drawer? Yeah. 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 What, is there anything else that goes in your sock drawer? Yes. 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 <laughs> Some, no, yes. What else goes in the sock drawer? Under, uh, sure, underwear. That's typically, that's what I do. I do like underwear, underwear. socks, yeah. t-shirts over here. Yeah. Well, you guys... There are certain types of t-shirts that go. <laughs> right. You guys have a strategy to your drawers, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Some people don't. They just start cramming things in their drawers. That's your sister. Even better, uh, this one may resonate with some of you. Um, hampers and clean versus dirty clothes. How many of you guys have a hamper someplace you put dirty clothes? Yay, do you put your dirty clothes in there? Yeah, okay. You put them in. There's a pile of dirty clothes in that hamper. You do the laundry. You come out. What do you do with the pile of clean clothes? You put it back in the same hamper. The Gary right. Do you then fold your clothes and put them away? Yes. Oh, now we have two distinct types of people. There is the type of people that have drawers that they are really religious about putting things away in. And then there are the type of people that have a dirty pile 
and a clean pile. And occasionally, an in-between that you sniff just to make sure. It, it, it happens. So compartmentalize the per people that have those drawers and they put things away perfectly. Non-compartmentalized. It's, it's clean, but it's all in a big pile. And you're just searching for a sock for 15 minutes. <laughs> That's surprisingly true. Um, my wife has recently decided, so my wife and I split the, the chores. Um, my job is load and unload the dishwasher. And really my job is load the dishwasher the first time and then she comes and fixes it because I obviously did it wrong. Um, because, oh, and your lives. Not that I'm off track, but uh, in your lives, the dishwasher. Is, you don't have a dishwasher? If you have a dishwasher, is it compartmentalized? Do you, is there a specific place for bowls and plate? Yeah, right? That's what my wife says too. You don't put bowls at the bottom. You don't put bowls, yeah. Well, I was just like, it's a dishwasher. I put a dish in, it'll get clean. You gotta think about, about gravity and. The Look, there's a lot that goes into it, but my thought was, I'm not very compartmentalized. I'm just gonna put these things everywhere. Wherever it fits, and it should get clean, because it's a dishwasher. No. What? The utensils, I guess, do need to go in that little utensil basket. The idea is there's a compartment and a place for everything. That's compartmentalized. That's like the eukaryotic cell. Other cells are non-compartmentalized. They don't have that place for everything to go. It says everything's everywhere. Um, children, God, when apparently when we're young, really, toys go everywhere. Yeah. Um, no, go as you get older, though, where do they live? right, well, as you get older, you're like, why don't you put your toys away in their proper place? Kids tend to be very non-compartmentalized. I've got my Legos, my trains, my Transformers, they're everywhere, well, the and I will play with all of them equally. But the Legos live on the road with the roads and the streets and the cars. <laughs> And that's on the well, no, that's the thing, though. Then the kids turn around and they're like, they, they lay it everywhere. The parents are like, put it in that box and put that box over there. Put it in that in that box and that box goes over there. Compartmentalization versus non-compartmentalization. Which is better? Neither. And I uh, know, because, you know, the people who have their clothes in two distinct piles are always going to have their clothes in two distinct piles because that's what works for them. It works just fine. Those that compartmentalize, it works fine for them. It's just two different ways of doing things. Now, with prokaryotes, all prokaryotes have three things in common. Thing number one they have in common, they all have a plasma membrane. Aha, uh -huh. this plasma membrane is made up of phospholipids. They've got this polar head and a nonpolar tail, so what are they termed? Amphipathic. Um, these, this phospholipid bilayer is going to be filled with proteins that allow things in and out, or allow for signaling. So all um, prokaryotes have a plasma membrane. All of them also have what's called a nucleoid region, a place where the DNA hangs out. It's not bound by anything. It's just this, this looping DNA that's held generally in one place but it could go anywhere. So it's a nucleoid region. And they all also have ribosomes. Ribosomes are proteins and nucleic acids combined together that build, uh, that convert RNA to a um, polypeptide. Pretty much these are little protein making factories. So, we've, uh, so all of them across the board have a plasma membrane, a nucleoid region, and ribosomes. Questions? That's just memorization. There's a lot of other stuff that they have that's sort of extra. Things that give them properties and things, but that not all of them share in common. Like pili. Pili are great. They're these little hair-like structures sticking out. These pili that stick out can be used for sort of grabbing onto things and pulling, walking along. They're also really important for sex between bacteria. That's how they hold each other. That's how they, 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 they hold on tight. And they can transfer DNA across them. They're hollow. So it's almost like, 
I don't know, E.T. touching fingers, except DNA, it. yeah, DNA transports, because it's a bad idea. Don't think about that. Um, it's the idea that you can pass DNA directly from one bacteria to another through its pili. They got flagella, these whip-like structures that can move it, acts like a motor. Cell walls. Um, a cell wall is there so that the bacteria doesn't explode when it's put in fresh water. You guys ever dropped a slug in a bucket of water? No. It gets softer and it swells up like a balloon. Do you put salt on them? That's the opposite way of going. It's really skinny. Right. You're, you're filling them up with osmosis. Water's coming, flooding into them. They're filling... Okay. Uh, you guys seen The Walking Dead? All right. You remember like first season, maybe second season when the walker got fell down the well? Yeah, and it was all bloated? What? It's like that. It's like that. <laughs> so, you didn't get the idea of a slug dropped in a bucket of water, but a corpse in water? Oh, yeah, we got that. Um, so, we got this corpse swelling, corpse swelling up, the cell swelling up. The cell wall would prevent that. And then we have glycocalyx. Glycocalyx is... Um, this layer of slimy uh, carbohydrates, it's almost like mucus. It protects the cell, makes it slide. Lots of different things in prokaryotes to protect them, let them move. So there we are. You were in my classroom and heard all the super exciting stuff we talk about all the time. Um, so don't you wish you were there? As far as this lecture, uh, this mini lecture goes, we talked about the cell theory, saying that all living things come from pre-existing cells. Cells are the smallest unit of life, and all organisms are made up of cells. Broadly, there are two categories of cells. There's prokaryote and eukaryote. The prokaryotes have no nucleus, uh, no com real compartmentalization, and the eukaryotes have a nucleus with some compartmentalization. We can visualize cells using different types of microscopes, from the light microscope to see living organisms in real color, to um, dissecting microscopes where we can see a three-dimensional image of them, to electron microscopes where you can see extraordinarily fine details of dead organisms, uh, either scanning to see their, what's on the outside of the cell, or a um, transmission electron microscope to see what's going on on the inside of the cell. We talked a little bit more in depth about prokaryotic cells having ribosomes to build proteins. They all have a cell membrane to allow some things in and not others, and a nucleoid region where they keep their DNA. And then we talked about some super cool uh, other structures like pili to help them uh, reproduce and to help them maybe move a little, flagella for movement, a cell wall to prevent them from osmotically lysing, and of course, my favorite, glycocalyx. Once again, we have some content review questions here to focus your learning. Um, in, the next, uh, in the next mini lecture, we're going to cover a little bit more about eukaryotic cells and um, specifically about uh, what's going on with the membrane of eukaryotic cells and the cytoskeleton. So stay tuned for that.